Shiva, and then it comes back. And the really nifty thing is that without having too much magic, I mean, this is self contained legal, actually, C code, and by virtue of that, most often also, I mean, most C code is also C++ code, almost all, is also C++ code. Um, it has a, a legit, um, correct uh, identifier in C++, we're actually pulling that, oops, excuse me, pulling that one out and making it the same identifier in R, which is also a step up in usability because we're all used to do these very tedious blue code things, and we would have function fuba bin C, being called by FUBA being R, and you know, then you have so your name is just blah. So now you have a function that actually tells you that 2 times 20 minus 42. It's not bad for a day's work, or two minutes. <laughs> um, so what happened? Well, we had a simple function. It uses a single integer argument. That's sort of kind of interesting actually because when you know R well enough, you know that single integers don't really exist. So that sort of gets worked out. Because in I, everything's a vector, the major set length one, but here it works on a single, it takes one sense on that. We're asking R to source it, uh, similar to the source command. Uh, behind the scenes, R puts a bit more code around it that is not hidden from you. If you say verbose equal true, you see the code that's being written and you see the compiler indications. And then it just sort of does these things. And that's actually sort of kind of neat for us. Because within RCPP, at that point, we're really only relying on facilities that R already has and gives us the package authors. So R sort of has figured out on each boss how it has to call the compiler and the encoder. That sort of just works. And we don't really have to reinvent that. Every now and then you have to sort of round out and, and, and add trouble again. And the function gets brought into R under the name and C++. Um, so CPP has two, um, two sort of cousins or siblings. The simplest one is eval CPP, a simple evaluator of an expression, similar, similar to eval and or pass in, in R. So if you say two times two, and you get four back, you've basically um, not only just wasted a few CPU cards, <laughs> but um, more importantly demonstrated to yourself that your system is set up right. So if something's not working right, it's always good to just backtrack and try something similar. Does 2 plus 2 or 2 times 2 work? Because that, again, with verbose equal true, gets wrapped up in a full compilation unit, gets compiled, being loaded, and the 4 gets being brought back by C. Um, that's sort of a minimal one, just for quick tests, quick lookups, or simple cases. And an intermediate variant is CVP function, which um, passes as a first argument a string that contains source code, that contains a function. We have written it all on a line. Uh, it's a variant of what we have before. One argument, uh, return one transformation in the function uh, delineated by the curlies, which I actually sometimes forget that when I type are mandatory in C uh, in how we can read them in this. Um, I think they are. Uh, or maybe something else happens here. Yeah. Um, it's a good practice to do that. Um, anyway, so that's the second thing. So where is this coming from? This is something um, John Chambers once, once told Roman and myself when we were out on the West Coast, and he had just used it a week before in a presentation at, uh, at the local university there. Um, this is a drawing from 76, when they were getting going with what turned into S, which then you know, is the language of which R is a dialect and now the meaning implementation. And this is actually this is pretty cool because he sort of Orders that in this sort of straightforward, earnest Canadian manner. I mean, not too much to smile, and it was very flattering. The idea really was that you would want to have systems that can take an entire object in your high level interactive exploratory environment, what we now have with R, take it down to harder, core, faster, compiled, efficient numerics libraries. Back then, in the day, of course, all their systems were Fortran systems. Um, so what the drawing sort of tries to symbolize is that there's an inner core of routine ADC that does stuff, a fitter maybe, or whatever, or a permutation algorithm, and a wrapper X ADC around it that allows you to more easily call this thing ADC. And you know, then there were some new links that they did about how you pass argument back and forth that, of course, at the time had more to do with uh, Fortran limitations or whatever. But it's basically, it's an idea about how they wanted things to be in 76, and more or less, sort of 35 years later, we were there with RCPP because we cannot take entire R objects, send them down to C++ school, work on them, and send them back. And that's sort of kind of, kind of nifty. Um, 
uh, when would one use this? So an example we've often used is a Fibonacci recurrence. This is defined um, as return for an argument n, the value of n if n is 0 or 1. This only works on hints. Um, uh, Non-negative hints. And if n is not, if it's 2 or greater, it's defined as a recurrence for the sum of the previous two elements. It's a beautiful little equation. It allows me to show off a little bit of latex with you know, equation over two lines, something that I don't do all that often anymore because I'm out of school. And then in code, it pretty much looks the same. You deal with the case of n being less than 2 and return n straight up as the formulation goes, or you return the sum of the two previous elements. It's a great case study. Uh, I'm not sure if any comp sci um, majors are here, but people use this a lot in, in analysis of, uh, of, of algorithms because it's terrible. Uh, it's worse than exponential. You have to work really hard to find some of those. So you would really want to do something like that with hashing, memorization, whatever. But if you do it naively, it has really bad performance. So there's a quick call of the first 11 elements. Because if you measure it and go from an argument of 10 to 15 to 20, so you're only increasing by half or a third, a third you're actually um, losing performance by a factor of just over 10. It seems to depend on when I run this. And now, thanks to Nita and Tashing, there's more we can be built. I think in the slide that I showed yesterday, I still have 10 and a half and 11 or something like that. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now we have 12 and 10 and a half, so there you go. Uh, but, but the deal is, it's, it's, really, it's really pretty bad. Because it's of course a constructed example, an example that's easy to show off because we know that R is very bad at function calling. There's a bit of overhead involved in the language, and you know you always got to pay somewhere for something, and so one of the shortcomings in R is before the function call. So, but again, the algorithm is super simple, so we can also deal with it in two lines in C or C plus plus. Small differences, you know, we have some corners at the end. Return requires parents around it. The language is typed, so we actually explicitly say. Uh, return an int if an int um, would make me actually even better to return a double so that you don't to overflow. And then in RCPP, you can just stick these two lines in the CPP function, and now you get a new function. The previous one we had called the F, C plus one we're calling a G, you get the same um, sequence of numbers back. And when you then do a little bit of um, uh, benchmarking, uh, for you know, got to kick someone when they're down. Um, for, for something where an opponent is weak, uh, of course you get um, very impressive comparisons. That's not what you usually get on normal examples. But, you know, for people who do a lot of MC, MC or other stuff or looping, they often see 60, 70, 80, 90 uh, as a speed gain. So that's, that's achievable. Just by switching to C++. So that's what you want to use. It. Um, um, here's a short list of a couple of packages that, uh, that use it. So uh, what I find quite satisfying is that a number of packages that already existed change and, and use it now. Um, that covers at least the first three of them. All by pretty well-known um, statisticians. And media is by public side people that do imputation. They just want a price for that package. They use Amadeo in that for. Um, for some linear algebra math, LV4 uses I again, focus against Amadeo, stand is big as F thing, to the Bayesian stuff in the Dregs and Bach style, Google is a fantastic information package. Um, Henry has uh, changed a few packages using it now. Joe's um, HDD UV that has event driven stuff that Chinese means in the back end uses it because there's a C library that, that, that required and it's easy to buy into libraries to that. And the last one is a uh, cheap hardware based uh, time series package from all such kind of these um, That was last week, as of today, we had 227, which, if we had bioconductor into it, is more than 250, which is pretty good uh, because JJ just reminded me today when we had beers not that long ago, I was just boasting that we're about to get 50. So that was spring, uh, spring two years ago, so maybe 27 months ago. So it's not so bad. Uh, what did we do? Well, we, um, we met types generally. Um, so I've shown you ints mostly with these Fibonacci examples. Slightly more useful is working on vectors. So if you have a sequence from minus 5 to 5, or 50 to 500, by some increment, I'm just keeping it short here so that it prints on the page. Then we can work on entire vectors the way we would in, um, in R. So if you've used C++ with class library before, you may have sort of seen things. This is intrinsically different from how long and apps are defined in the library. because in in the standard C++ libraries, of course, they work on a single double, but here it's now defined on, on 
our wrappers basically on us, uh, of us uh, record representation. So all these things happen relatively lightweight. Taking log of apps, of course, is a uh, nonsensical operation, but it's one that I can put in a line and have here for comparison. Um, you can do things different ways because you can work on our vectors or you can work on standard vectors from standard C++. But that's actually really good if you have to work in larger projects where you want to have code that you need to test in other environments or want to reuse in other environments. I have a, I have a fellow who once came to a talk, I, uh, uh, from a friend in Atlanta who also works in financial services in a very regulated environment where you need to do testing. So he has to do, God bless his soul, everything in Visual Studio. So he prefers to rather develop his code in R with these tools, but then write C++ modules that then he puts an additional layer of glue in between, but the, the ones that he wants to actually put into production, the headers will not include the R or RCPP or r and headers, so he can test them in our framework as the interactivity, the control from R, data generation, summarizing, or whatever, and then he can pass it back on, and what he hands his Swift IT department is straight up standard C++ code. So he has locks up Lots of apps, again, how you would do it um, with one of these STL algorithms, I won't sort of dwell on that. And so you can do the same thing there. So CPP, unsurprisingly, does the same. And then, uh, why is that out of sequence? Um, you can also do the same thing with newer um, C variants. So we have a plugin that turns on C11 support. And if you use the C++ STL before, you will recognize what I had on the previous slide that you need basically a separate thing that needs to be defined so that the STL can sweep over the vector and apply that. And that now with C++ 11, you need no longer need. And you get what the Cognoscenti called a lambda function. Basically, an anonymous function, which is completely old head to our this because that's the thing that we have at the end of an asset by or whatever. It's basically the function defined on the fly. And yes, C++ can do that now, and hence so can so can we. Why did I have this one in between? Oh yes, types. So I was just talking about types before I was going to um, C++ 11. So if you want to do math, you can also do math very easily. Um, we sort of stopped short of putting a real matrix operation in the math sense in all our math and um, vector classes because it's a lot of work and other people have done it. So whenever I actually, whenever I want to really crunch numbers, I do that with Amadeo types. Here's a really simple example. I pass in a vector A, and I can, excuse me, immediately return A times A transpose, or you can do the opposite, A transpose A times A, then you get a single back, and so those are the great, great examples. So real uh, powerful uh, matrix um, classes are available to that scene. Uh, and um, uh, I guess so we're trying to do this in half an hour today, so I'll just go quickly about that. I have a couple more slides with a bit more meat on the eval CVP that I talked about briefly. Basically, single expressions get evaluated, compiled, linked, and returned to you, just the return value. CVP function similar, but it builds a function for you that becomes a call of a function here again, is one that uses a little bit of C11. And we're showing how we can on the fly. Um, augment the behavior of the compiler by enabling an 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 optional features. We do that for C11 and newer, or sort of half older for the interim state and on Windows as well as for OpenMP, which gives you parallelism. And then there's the bigger uh, source CPP. And here we also mentioned that source CPP and the others have hooks for using Amadeo, IAG, and GSL, and other things. Um, another big thing, though, is uh, packages. You know, this, this sort of it was a given, we didn't even have to talk about that because the packet call the talk was just about, about how you can, with the universe of packages, take arbitrary snapshots of your packages for usability. You really should be working in the packages. With packages, goes without saying. So once you have RCPP code, do put it in a package. We have an alpha function, RCPP package skeleton, wrapping around uh, R's package skeleton, which you may have used to start writing packages. And, and again, um, RStudio sort of has has nice IDE hopes for that. If you go into, I always lose my way there, session new project, build new project, what one of the so files is now file new project. File new project. When you get into new package and it comes up with defaults, then you have to do one toggle from normal package to package with RCPP, and you will have a working RCPP package just like that, which again just hooks into package features that we have in the package because the skeleton function does that. Um, I 
At this point, of course, I have to insert an advertisement for the fact that I now have a package that has a picture of a kid on its GitHub page. Because <laughs> I got so tired of package skeleton, which I've used for I've about 10, 15 years to build packages, and it gives you a working package, and then you run R command check on it, and you know, I'm as German as you guys are, and the thing comes back with errors. So you just ask the language facility to create you something, it comes back with errors. It's just insane, right? And nobody fixed it ever. So I just kind of got tired of it, and now I have a little thing that runs a filter over it and takes the errors out. So if you create a package with kitten, then you get a package that purrs, just like a kitten. <laughs> so uh, I will um, uh, change RCPP to use kitten if available, and then I have to petition these gentlemen to, of course, create, have, the, have the button create, uh, have the button use kitten as well. So that's a, that, that's a side issue. So yes. Um, uh, again, you know, RCP package skeleton does these things, and it also gives you packages that, that go straight into R. So you don't have to go back to the manuals, because God forbid we're all too busy for read documentation. Um, sugar um, is another one of these uh, features. RCP really is a collection, is a bag of tricks and other features. Sugar is a nice one. I've, I've shown you some of those things before, um, where we did uh, the vectorization on, on log apps. Here's another quick example. It's sort of this old story of um, how do you estimate the value of pi uh, really, really tediously. So the idea there is that um, the surface of a circle is pi r squared. So without loss of generality, beautiful phrase that I don't get to use anymore now that I work in industry. We set an r to 1, and we have a unit circle. And then we take a corner of the unit circle, that's a one quadrant. And now we're actually in the first quadrant of the coordinate system. Meaning we're on the x-axis and the y-axis between 0 and 1. Meaning we want a lot of random coordinates between 0 and 1 on one axis and the other. Which is, give us x, give us y, then we're calculating the distance to the unit circle and figuring out whether we're inside or above. That's basically the throwing of the darts and counting how many of these darts are inside, which we're scaling by the number of tries that we had and multiplying by 4 so that we get out of the you know, quarter of the pizza back to the whole pie and then we have a number that estimates pi. It's a great example for introducing Monte Carlo because it also illustrates really, really well how poorly Monte Carlo can converge. I mean, it's a bit like starting with a, with a binomial to get to a normal eventually. Eventually, some of you get that, but if you just use 10 to the power of 3 and I think I had to, yes, I had to try at least 10 or 15 seed values so that these values look sensible because if you just use a random seed or another fixed seed then you end up with 3.0, 3.3 and you know eventually of course and you have more digits you, you sort of get. It's, it's a cute example, it's a silly way of calculating pi but the nice thing is you can do exactly the same thing in four lines of code with sugar because we can draw and get a vector back for x and for y we can calculate the distance of all those points at once to the square and we can sum up over the logical to see how many of those there were and we turn it all into a double. Uh, the slide also gives me a chance to talk about RMG scope um, which is a small handshaking class that does a little bit, a little bit of the um, required work that's needed to keep the random number generator in the same state as you're going from R to compile code and back that again is sort of one of these small little tidbits in Python R extensions that we need to, need to take care of and we do. Meaning that if you set the random number generator to a fixed seed and ask for a fixed number of uniforms or normals or whatever from R, you get the same from, from RCPP as you get from, um, uh, from, from plain R, which uh, you know, this we demonstrates. So I set the seed to 42 which are often used and then ask for 10 million this way or that way, they really are the same. <coughs> which, again, at 10 million is a reasonable request. Um, timing in this particular example, not that great a difference because what we're doing on the R side is really not all that expensive, so there wasn't that much that we could, we could gain. What we're mostly gaining is a little bit of function called overhead and, and probably tests for um, missing values and things like that. So, a little example. I think I just sort of mostly skip that again. This is sort of three ways of calculating the cumulative sum for a vector. You can either do it, and that's a perfectly fine way of doing it, sort of the pedestrian way in a loop. Uh, create a vector and at each element 
uh, write the current um, value of the accumulated sum in there. You can do it uh, with an SDL algorithm. Um, they have the craziest names, unfortunately, that aren't always obvious, but partial sum is what they call what we call the cumulative sum. Um, we have a common sum sugar function, and then, of course, all of these are the same. So, different ways of doing that. Uh, you can, if you must, um, call an R function from C, um, which is great, actually. You write code, and often there's sort of a cognitive barrier that you kind of think, oh, damn it, I sort of have this project, and I want to really write it in C to make it faster, but there is whatever, this component to it, the outset read configuration, talk to a database, um, draw me a picture, whatever. And well, you're not really, really blocked because if you have to, you can still just invoke that R code and concentrate on the other parts of your program where switching to C is making uh, a lot of performance uh, difference. It's also useful when you need to debug or benchmark or compare. So uh, being able to call back out to R is good. It's just don't be misled, don't think just because you're calling R from C that you can be at C speed. Some people sort of seem to think that, and then the house is like overflow. Oh, yo, I mean, that function is no faster. Well, guess what, buddy? It's still the same function. Um, uh, another big thing is if you're into C, there is something called Boost, which is an awesome, very large, extremely peer reviewed, vetted, high quality. Not totally coherent, but it's, it's, it's a lot of different topics in, in programming library. Uh, a lot of it is, is header only, which makes using for us uh, pretty uh, easy, and we have a package called BH on, for boost headers. I do understand, of course, that BH uh, has a different meaning in German, and that's a bit of a running joke when I uh, set the package up with a couple of friends in the States. Um, we can do C11, um, but, but as I mentioned, we can do Amadeo, so you get the same eigenvalues back. We can work on attributes, so this is, um, I use time series in XTS sort of all day long with the Kauska mod, and this uh, creates an XTS object that's indistinguished from one created in R, so we can see how that works. Um, and I think that's that. Uh, we have a bunch of vignettes. Three of the vignettes, one out of RCPV, two out of the math packages are papers now, we have a mailing list. There are stack overflow posts that I have made the mistake of responding to, so people keep asking more, so uh, by all means do. And there's blog posts left, right, and center. Another excellent idea of JJ's that became a fantastic time sink for all of us now, which became a fantastic resource, is the gallery. We have a website, gallery.rcpv.org, that's open for contributions. If you have a nice, coherent little story, just send us a, a, a patch, a page, that can be marked down with embedded C++ or C++ with embedded R, it's pretty easy to do. And it's just, it's a smorgasbord of different topics. I mean, there are a few there about how to do things that are not faster with data frames, how to do indexing, or whatever. I mean, that's, a, that's a great showcase. And it lives on GitHub, code is all there. You, in theory and practice, should just be able to download the raw source code and run it on your machine. I mean, we're trying to do this without external uh, meditation, with, with, with external uh, dependencies, and the one or two limitations that we have is that we can't take math in the markup, and we can't really do external libraries sort of all that. Oh, and no graphs, so it was the other thing. Uh, but otherwise that's there, and I have a book, and because I have to feed my kids and get them to college, we all have to buy the book. That's uh, 